Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 65 of Ancient Office Hours. This week, my guest is Dr. Jonathan Hall, a professor of classics at the University of Chicago. His early research was focused on the cultural and social history of ancient Greece, with a particular emphasis on the construction, meaning, and functions of ethnic identity among Greek communities. His most recent book is Reclaiming the Past, Argos and its Archaeological Heritage in the Modern Era. He is also the author of a series of articles and chapters concerning the early polis, Greek colonization, and cultural identities. In this episode, we talked about how PhD programs in the U.S. and U.K. have changed, why people have historically thought race and ethnicity are the same thing, whether the Dorian invasion was a real historical event, and how to navigate different research methodologies. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I really appreciate you taking the time. So I want to just start us off and hopefully ask what I hope will be a pretty simple question, which is, how did you get into classics and ancient history? It's such a niche subject. So I'm always very curious by how people fall into it. Well, thank you for inviting me, Lexi. Uh, it's great to talk to you. Um, by now, you've heard so many people describe this journey that you've probably identified. I suspect there's only about three different patterns. Um, and I correspond to the the sort of life way um, that is really accidental i mean i not due to many conscious choices i was um i was brought up and educated in the united kingdom and uh i was fortunate enough to win a scholarship to a public school which as you probably know in in britain means the complete opposite to what a public school means in in the states um and so from age 11 latin was mandatory you know that 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 just wasn't up for discussion at age 12 technically um we had a choice between ancient greek and german and i wanted to study german i just thought it was more relevant more useful and so on it turned out the choice wasn't actually mine to make uh, the school made it for me and they assigned me to ancient greek because in their view uh, my latin was marginally better than my french so i ended up doing these two languages and i'm not sure i especially distinguished myself at them but I guess I just was worse at other subjects. So when it when it came to um, A levels, uh, the last two years of of high school in the UK, um, I went into the classical sixth form, as it's called, and took exams in Latin, Greek, ancient history, uh, to which I added um, music. Um, and about half of the pupils in the classical sixth were encouraged to apply to Oxford, and and, and so I did that, but. My aim to get to Oxford was partly just to be just to be there. I mean, I wasn't terribly excited about studying classics there, but what I did want to study was law. I wanted I wanted a profession in the law. Um, and the fact of the matter was that statistically speaking, it was easier to get accepted at Oxford if you applied to classics than if you applied directly to law. So that's what I did. My plan was I'll do the first five terms, almost two years of classics, and then I'll switch. I'll say, you know, classics isn't for me. I, I, I want a career in the law and so on. And, um, well, so the five terms passed, and I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with this. I'll get a degree in classics, and then I'll, you know, after graduating, I'll, I'll, I'll convert to law. And for those last seven terms, we had to choose two out of three subjects, and the subjects were literature, uh, philosophy and ancient history. And I, this is ironic now, but I didn't want to study ancient history, right? I'd done it at A level um, and I found it um, pretty boring. Um, you know, Charles Hignett's History of the Athenian Constitution is not a scintillating read on the best of days. And I really couldn't care less who was standing next to whom at the Battle of Plataea. 
And and all of the history we did at school was all political and, and military and so on. So I wanted to do uh, philosophy and literature, but for a variety of reasons, I guess the short story is it turned out that I wasn't that good at philosophy. So I did end up doing ancient history. Um, we didn't have a tutor in ancient history at my college, so I was sent out. And this is one of those moments, again, I'm sure this is a common trope to many of your uh, guests' stories about this. I, I had the fortune to, to be hooked up with a, with a brilliant teacher um, who was Nicholas Purcell, who's now the Camden Professor of Roman History um, at Oxford. And he is a Romanist um, primarily. Um, but he also has wide-ranging interests, including in early Greece, which which was what really interested me. And it was a type of history I'd never experienced before, you know, social history, cultural history, economic history. But also um, the term that I arrived, uh, Nicholas started something called the New Initiative, which was designed to make ancient historians aware of the possibilities and enrichment to their studies that archaeology could provide. And it's that interest in archaeology that I think has also remained a, a sort of um, fixed feature in the, in most of my scholarship. Wow. Um, I would say it's more common, I think, to, well, maybe not more common, but but I, I've definitely heard a lot of people approach classics from wanting to go into a different field and then sort of get stuck and say, you know, it's not that bad. Okay, I'll stay. I like it. And have a good mentor and say, all right, I'm 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 sticking with it. So, but it is interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know. Is it a, as common in the UK, do you think, as it is in the US for um, people who have an eye on law to end up in classics? Because I know here in the States, it's a, it's a very common double major that they encourage people to do um is it is it also a, a popular suggestion in the uk no less popular i think because uh the the practice um in the united states of course is is to get a, a bachelor's degree at a liberal arts college um or, or or a university but then to go to law school to specialize whereas um everything in the uk is is earlier you specialize far earlier um uh, so most people who go into law actually read law as their degree subject at the BA. Uh, so, you know, um, had had I stuck with classics and then gone into law, I would have actually gone to law school for a year. Um, but, but, but most people would have had a head start on that. Yeah, I, th I think I find that a lot of my British friends find this concept of our pre-anything tracks in the US to be very, very strange. Pre-med, pre-law, people are like, what... Why do you need that? Um, eh, you know, I suppose it's just different, different way the that education goes. But um, in 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 your describing of of basically coming into classics, not wanting to stick, and then finally finding something amazing that that you that did interest you, how did you go about in grad school, sort of picking your specialty, your area of emphasis? Um, because obviously the it's it's a bit frustrating cuz i i found it frustrating when talking to professors about potentially going on and doing something they would always say you know okay well you have to sort of paint with broad brush strokes oh but then you do need to find something quite niche and small and can you do that can you find this balance and i was like i don't know i don't know what i like i just like a large swath of things so how did you navigate that process so yeah i know that this is a topic of an earlier discussion you've had on this podcast um particularly framed around the the personal statement in, in graduate applications uh because on the one hand an admissions committee wants to wants to see okay you have some sort of idea about what you want to study all right but on the other hand you know that's a little narrow-minded isn't it i mean if you come into a graduate program you say this is what i want to do um, then that's going to close off all sorts of other avenues that might have actually been more appropriate or more interesting. Um, everything, again, is different in Britain. The PhD is shorter. I mean, American PhDs are now becoming shorter. Um, but, you know, when I was when I was chairing the classics department you know, back in the first decade of this century, we had people on the books who had been doing their PhDs for 21 years or something, right? Now, in Britain, it's really, really short. So you actually, and, and there's no coursework. Or I mean, there is now if you if you do an MPhil, but but in, in the old days, if you if you go straight into a PhD, there is no coursework. 
Basically, the day you arrive, you're supposed to start working on your dissertation. So you need to know what that dissertation is going to be. And fortunately, um, I did. Um, and I decided that I, I wanted to to study ethnicity um, in Greece. Oh, goodness. I, I have heard that the programs are short and they are very intense because, I mean, you're only doing a PhD. You only get, what, three, four years of funded work in the UK? Yeah, I think it's I think it may now be four. But uh, in those days, it was three. Yeah. OK, so I'm curious because I don't get to talk to a lot of people who've come through a different system. Um, you know, when if you're a young student, and you're trying to just figure out what system you might want to go into. I mean, I think a lot of people with especially the economic situation today might look at the UK European systems and say, oh, it's 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 shorter, it's less time, I could be through it and just get my PhD versus I'm I know from talking to friends that there are really great advantages to the American system. So as someone who's working in the American system, but who's come up through a completely different one, um, you know, is there like a substantial difference now? Have they gotten closer? You know, why should someone choose one system or the other? Is it personal preference? Like, how does a young person navigate this decision who's basically balancing life and money and all these other things? I think I think it is largely personal preference. And, and it really depends on how prepared or how well versed you feel in classical culture when you start your PhD. Um, I mean, if you had the advantage of taking a lot of classics related uh, subjects at your undergraduate college, um, then then perhaps you don't need an extra two years of coursework at the PhD level. Um, if, on the other hand, you came to classics late, I mean, there are plenty of people who don't actually declare their classics major until, you know, their third year or so, um, then it might be useful. To, to to get the US system of, ha of having some additional coursework. Um, I think, you know, certainly there is an advantage or for those people who consider it an advantage, I mean, in doing, in in taking less time uh, to complete your PhD. But, but again, I would say that they're becoming a little closer now because most American universities are really trying to reduce their time to degree. Um, I think it is the case that you're likely to be much better funded in the US. I, I, I don't know what the rates are now um, in the UK, but I, I remember that I had to live off two thousand pounds a year, right? And we're not—it wasn't back in the Middle Ages, right? <laughs> um, so even even allowing for inflation and so on, I mean that wasn't tuition; that that was just maintenance, of course, but um, stipend or so on. But I think in you know some people think about it; they they make a calculation in terms of employability. I mean, the advantages of a UK degree, a UK PhD, are perhaps that you can find employment in both the US and the UK, or at least you can when the employment market is in a good position or better position. So that might give people a slight advantage. But, you know, as, as, as you suggest, I think it really is a matter of personal preference and what works best for you. There is no doubt that um, the, the UK system is, is less structured. So you need to be really self-disciplined, um, especially, you know, you know, you're working... You're working on a subject that's supposed to be innovative, right? So therefore, your main supervisor may have some expertise, but if they know everything about it, then you haven't chosen a subject that's innovative enough. So as I say, in the UK, you know, you really have to sort of get going as soon as you start. And, and it, it's, it's a lot of working on your own. Um, there's there's a lot more sort of mentorship and pedagogical, pedagogical structure in the US but again, you know, some people prefer a hands. I, I certainly prefer a more hands off approach. It's so interesting because it, it it sounds a little like the decision for that that I made when considering master's programs because I was told yes, a lot of master's programs they are very sort of hands on. They they lead you as much as as they can to to success and and to guide you. And I chose to do a one year master's program in. Athens, Greece, in Europe, and it was uh, barely structured. I mean, they were like, okay, you show up and here's your class and here's your test. But other than that, um, it's completely self-directed. So I can see where, yeah, it would really come down to, okay, well, do I want someone who basically is on me all the time or just says, okay, go off and present me with your finished product? So um, I feel like that's a... That's its own level of, of stress um, 
that that you would choose to put on yourself um but you know hey i have friends who work really well with saying yeah don't don't bother me i just i know what i'm going to do you tell me i can do it and i'll do it and and now i want to get a little into your your area of expertise what you did study so what was it about like the 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 social history and the culture of ancient Greece that, that drew you so much to it. Um, because obviously that's, that's a lot. Um, so was it something uh, like specific that you wanted to hone in on or are you more like big picture and you wanted to understand things sort of, um, in, in context in relation to each other? You know, I am interested in, in, in the bigger picture, right? uh, but, um, in terms of my my early research, it was really more focused on on ethnicity, which which is both a social and a, a cultural uh, feature of of any um, historical society. Mm-hmm. Actually, I mean, the reason why I got involved in that uh, is 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 pretty banal. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, it was it was no great design. It, it proved to be. Um, particularly serendipitous that I I started it when I did. But um, it, it all started, I, I had a, a fellowship to travel to Greece in 1986. And what I wanted to do was study the history and archaeology of a place called Trezina in the Argolid region. This is ancient Troizene, where Euripides' Hippolytus is set. And I kept on reading in the secondary literature um, this this sort of dictum that uh, is it following Pausanias that originally the population of this of this city of this area had been Ionian and then at some point after the supposed date of the Trojan War Dorians streamed in and sort of took over all the institutions and I I was just sort of standing there or sitting there I guess reading this and sort of scratching my head and trying to think well okay but how did this actually happen on the ground Right. I mean, did these Ionians, did they hang around? And and if so, what sort of position did they occupy in society after that? And and what does it even mean to think of yourself as Ionian or Dorian in the in the early Iron Age? So the this so it's a very sort of specific case study that got me thinking more broadly about what ethnicity meant um in the ancient world. And as I said, it was a particularly appropriate time, about a decade earlier. Um, ethnicity had suddenly become a hot topic in social anthropology, um, largely due to the realization that this 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 great pipe dream of the melting pot in America um, <laughs> hadn't succeeded, and the ethnic minorities were, weren't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, obviously things come to classics a little bit later. Um, but a few years before I started my doctoral research, uh, Edith Hall brought out her book on inventing the barbarian. Uh, which employed a lot of um, current, then current social anthropological theory. My uh, friend and colleague, Cathy Morgan, who used to be a director at the British School at Athens, was also working on similar issues and had generated a bibliography. So, so you know, I, I managed to sort of join in part of the uh, energy, the enthusiasm of, of, of that subject with this particular focus on how ethnicity worked in Greece. Oh, that's so cool. I I vaguely remember hearing about that location only because I did like a day trip to Poros one day and I think I saw like coin deposits and other things um and I remember turning to my friend and saying wow I don't remember this at all F- funnily enough I first got to uh, visit Troyzine when I went on a family trip to Poros yes wow okay yeah I was like do things come from there to the other close islands, Egina or Stepsis or these other, or is it is Poros like where most of the stuff comes from? No, I mean, well, so Poros um, has a, a small museum uh, which has actually recently been renovated, and it has material from the sanctuary of Poseidon, which is right at the top of the island of Poros. Um, but it also has material from uh, from Troisine because uh, Troisine doesn't have its own museum, so that's why. And it's it, it's not that far. I mean, you just you just head on to the mainland and take a, a short uh, bus ride. Okay, okay, that makes a lot more sense. So, in I'm I'm very curious. By I mean, I don't really know many friends now who have chosen to go in and study um, ethnicity in in ancient Greece, but. I think a lot of people 
don't really think about, you know, what what are the layers there? What does that mean to study? Um, because I've noticed a trend in talking with young people today when they think of issues of race and ethnicity. The only thing they think about is difference in terms of either skin color or like culture. So like the, the ancient Persians and, and the Greeks or the, the Egyptians, because they clearly looked different. Um, you know, would you say is that an accurate way for students now to be thinking about it or should we be thinking about it in a completely different way because obviously i think that there's race and ethnicity while very similar and there's a ton of overlap i don't think that they're the same but i'm really interested by like why do students basically put them together and only think about them that way when thinking about the ancient world yeah, that's such a good question, uh, um, and it's it's is the answer. I guess is pretty complicated. I mean, part of it, I think, um, is just due to the history of scholarship in America, right? Um, where racial issues are obviously um, always of relevance, but uh, but also in Europe, uh, you know, as part of the the decolonization uh, project. But you know, ethnicity is is really collective identity that's constructed using a variety um, of different traits, um, of which one is physical appearance. And it seems to me that nowadays when most people talk about race, they are actually, as, as you say, they're really talking about colour, which is just one type. I mean, there, there used to be this idea that, that race was a, you know, race was to ethnicity as biological sex was to gender, right? The, 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 the former is biological and the, and the other is sort of sociological and it's all constructed. I don't think anyone really believes that anymore because it, actually, if you look back at the way the term race has been used, it's just as constructed, um, as anything that we associate with ethnicity. So I, you know, a, a, a ethnicity, I think is, is perhaps the, the broader category category um but for very valid reasons race just has a, a has a more immediate um purchase right it just seems inherently more relevant because we are also dealing now i would say we're also dealing with ethnic issues and particularly in europe where uh, and especially the balkans let's say um where you have had some very bloody uh, wars between ethnic groups that effectively look the same Right, they may practice different religions, they may speak different languages. Effectively, though, they they look the same. So, so ethnicity is is is, is I would say a broader category, and race is in some ways a rather narrower category, but not any less important for that. And it's interesting because it does affect because people. Well, I took one class, so it's not like I'm a great expert or anything. But I was noticing when talking about and analyzing two cultures that were very distinct, but like geographically close and so we associate them being very similar one thing i noticed living in greece the past year and a half or whatever is when talking about like ancient cyprus let's say people don't really see a distinction they're like ah just just lump them in with the greeks they're they're basically not different that's you know what let's just consider cyprus another basically greek island um and and so it's it's very interesting just to see how we basically interpret these things. And um, I've, I've noticed that goes back to even looking at civilizations in early Greece. I mean, looking at there's that age old debate right over the Mycenaeans and the Minoans. Who was actually Greek? Who was not Greek? Are they ethnically Greek? Are they racially Greek? So. Um, you know, is that something that you've come across? Have are people? Is that actually something people are still really debating? Whether Mycenaean, Minoan, are they ethnically the same? Are they different? Are they? Um, yeah, um, and I think actually it's a topic that I think is being discussed a little bit more in certain corners of Greek academia right now. I mean, you know, there've been a bunch of um, ancient DNA studies that have come out fairly recently, um, which people have got very excited by, um, trying to show the origins of these people. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm not entirely persuaded that the DNA evidence is telling us anything different from what we thought we already knew, which is that the language that the Mycenaeans um, spoke was an early form of Greek, and that the language that the Minoans spoke was not. 
uh, was some other language entirely. Wow. Um, something we've suspected for a long time, and I, I think has become especially apparent now in the the most recent excavations at Pylos. Um, there is a great deal of contact and probably intermarriage uh, between the Mycenaeans and, and, and the Minoans, and so that 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 that's an that that's an issue that I think is 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 uh, attracting a lot of attention at present. Although I should say I'm not I'm not a prehistorian, but um. I mean I think it's fascinating. Uh, although as someone who's interested in early Greek communities, I did want to ask, why do you think people are? I mean, obviously, a lot of people study all different periods of Greece, which is normal. I mean, it's all very interesting. But why is there this like super fascination? And and I've noticed this fascinating even with like people who are not in classics professionally, just like friends who like ancient Greece casually, there's this very deep fascination with Bronze Age collapse and all these uh, society, these early communities and, uh, you know, oh, they were doing so well and then they just poofed out of existence. So um, is it like a human fascination with just like mysterious things? Yeah, no, I, I, th- I think that's exactly right. Everyone, everyone likes a mystery, right? And um, I think if, you know, if if the Mycenaean political system had collapsed and been immediately replaced by something, perhaps there would be a little less attention. But the fact that you have this sort of period that itself has become highly contested in recent decades, you know, we, we used to call it the Dark Age. That's considered politically incorrect now because we know so much about it. But to be honest, everything we know about it <laughs> suggests that, yeah, things are a lot, lot worse uh, than they had been, or, you know, or at least prosperity has disappeared. The sort of prosperity that was enjoyed by the Mycenaeans has disappeared. And would it wouldn't be until the sort of 8th century that you you sort of recover um, that level of, of wealth. So I, I think the the combination of the collapse and then what originally looked like three or four centuries of nothingness. I mean, as I said, we we do know now more about it, but 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 still, but those things in combination. I mean, they, they make for a great mystery. So it, it's a who done it, right? What was responsible for the for the collapse of the Mycenaean civilization? And of course, the current example is uh, the current answer is. Uh, a whole lot of things, <laughs> the, the, the things that are all tied together. There's no one single uh, unicausal uh, explanation for it. And where do you stand on this theory of the Dorian invasion? Uh, like, were the Dorians real? I mean, the in popular stories and circles, I mean, the, to the layman, they, I know a lot of people think, oh, well, they're, they're said to be these like mythical descendants of Hercules or something like that, right? So uh, they came down and they invaded Greece and everything just went boom. But as someone who actually looks at these things, you know, were they real? Like, if they were, were they actually Greek? Where do you stand on that? Well, they, they were real um, in terms of what we might call social reality. Right. Um, meaning that by the fifth century, there are cities, especially in the Peloponnese, Argos, Corinth, Sparta, but also on Crete, uh, Rhodes and the other Dodecanesian islands. And these communities think of themselves as Dorians. And they think that they are descended from people who originally migrated from somewhere. I mean, the accounts differ, but from somewhere in central or northern Greece. So there is a reality to being Dorian in the fifth century. Now, the question is, is there was there actually a Dorian migration? All right. Um, because the Greeks, of course, uh, being uh, very curious had a story for everything, right? I mean, this, this is partly myths, but partly also traditions. I mean, these are the traditions that explain if there are Dorians in these places in the fifth century, how did they get there? When did they get there? And so we have these literary traditions that you mentioned. The Dorians um, are actually led by the descendants of Heracles. So, so they're not quite the same, but the descendants of Heracles serve as their leaders and bring them down into the Peloponnese, and then they spread out throughout the southern um, Aegean. And so um, since the 19th century, uh, scholars have tried to find the linguistic or the material reflexes of this migration, or actually in, in, in the sources, it's, it's, it's phrased as an invasion. So they, so they wanted to prove the historicity of these stories about the Dorians by finding their kind of material calling card, if you like. Um, and you can do that. You can do that 
to a certain extent with language, but this, I mean, you know, there there are a set of dialects that are more similar to one another than they are to some other dialects, and we've often called them the Doric or the West Greek dialect group. But this, of course, assumes that all linguistic similarities are inherited uh, longitudinally, shall we say, rather than spread or borrowed or imitated latitudinally. So that, that's one problem. The, the attempt to try to prove archaeologically uh, the arrival of Dorians has, has basically ended up in a dead end. But when I started my doctoral dissertation, actually, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to find the material reflex of the Dorians in Argos. But there, you know, then there, there had recently been a, a study which tried to connect the Dorians with a particular uh, burial form, burial single burial in the cyst grave. And I realized pretty early on that that didn't work at all. So I started searching for all sorts of other material uh, imprints of, of, of this invasion and couldn't find them. Uh, so I then had to spend the rest of my doctoral research trying to figure out why I couldn't find them. Um, and obviously, you know, by turning to the social anthropological literature, when you realize that the ethnicity is constructed, and when you think more about the nature of early Greek history and traditions, and you realize that uh, what purport to be traditions are really functioning to explain how things are in the present. You know, this 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 old idea that there's no smoke without there's no smoke without a fire, right? Or that, that all of these traditions must have a nugget of truth. They may, but they don't have to. There's no necessity for any of these things to have a, have a nugget of truth. And so I actually went back to these, these literary traditions again about the arrival of the Dorians, and I managed to, I suppose it was a type of structuralist analysis, but I, I managed to sort of deconstruct them and show that actually uh, what we call the tradition on the Dorian uh, migration is an amalgamation of different, sometimes contradictory stories. And so they clearly, I mean, at a certain point where people wanted to form links of affinity with one another, they said, well, we act like a big family, we're Dorians, blah, blah, blah. And at that point, they start inventing these stories to account for why they consider themselves to be Dorians. But um, these stories take slightly different forms in depending on where they're actually invented and what purposes they're serving. And then someone at a later date, you know, if it's Ephorus or if it's Apollodorus, they try to rationalize, they try to jam them all together into a single narrative. But you can you can actually pick it apart and see see the different original strands in that. So what I'm hearing is it sounds like it's one big methodological nightmare to try to accurately prove that they existed or didn't exist it is it is but but actually you know methodology is also something that i've i've focused on in in my middle career i would say and i i actually find it fun i mean you know even even if you have to throw your hands up in the air and say we don't know i think you know just going into the sort of historian's laboratory and sort of figuring through all these different pieces of evidence and the most appropriate methodology to apply to each is just fun. And, and it really, really shows, I think, the, the active nature of the historian. I think too often, you know, when we see documentaries on PBS or National Geographic or, or the history, well, not the History Channel, because they only show things about aliens now, but, uh, but uh, you know, other, other, other channels. I mean, there's, there's this idea that history is out there and historians are just people who have very good memories or, or the ability to serve as raconteurs who can sort of relay this, this information to everyone. But in a sense, all they're doing really is regurgitating. And so if you take a history course at either high school or college, all you're going to be doing is learning stuff and regurgitating. That's not what history is at all, right? Um, and so when you actually get into method and what are the appropriate methods with regard to different sorts of evidence in different historical contexts, I think that's when it, when history really becomes exciting. You get to be the detective, right? I mean, I couldn't agree more. I would love to do more. And actually, that that reminded me, for my listeners who, and I, I believe a lot, are not familiar with how to do methodology within something like ancient history, because I think when I first heard the word before I got into academia, sort of, I only associated it for whatever reason with science. I thought, oh, okay, you say methodology, and I think we do a science experiment in a lab, and that is, you know, it's in its box. But when it comes to like studying actual methodology within 
historical cycle and and there are so many different ways to do it i think people just kind of don't know what that means so as someone who has looked at that in your career do you mind explaining for us like what does it mean to study and and build and figure out different methodologies within the historical context because yeah we're not really used to hearing that word associated with history we usually think science yeah so um i mean what typifies ancient history is a paucity of evidence, right? I mean, compared to, I, I'm in, I'm in both a history and a classics department, and compared with my history colleagues, uh, the amount of information that I have at my fingertips is is a fraction of of what of what even a medieval historian, let alone a 20th century American um, historian, uh, can have access to. So you need to find the right tools to extract as much information out of these tiny little glints of of evidence as you can. And there are a variety of ways of doing this. And and one which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think is becoming now uh, more standard, but what wasn't always, um, is archaeology, is is thinking about literary sources and material culture. But there are pitfalls with that, right? Because why should we assume that one little pot you know, that we find in a ploughed field has anything to do with one of the few uh, events that Thucydides thought to recount one day. So, you know, there there are a whole set of, I would say, rules. Now, it's it's a little, actually, I I shouldn't talk about differences with science because I I, I was never very good at science. So scientific methodology um, may be just as um, subjective as historical methodology. But what I, the point I want to make about historical methodology is, is this: there's no hard and fast rules. But what we're setting up is a series of likelihoods um, of, in other words, of questions that you have to ask yourself when you're engaging with evidence, whether it's literary evidence, whether it's material evidence, one of the most obvious being, when does it date? Right? I mean, that, you know, People think that archaeologists have almost an obsession with dating, but it's an important part, obviously, of what they do if they're telling a story. But when it comes to literary sources, particularly if you're looking at the earlier part of of Greek history, the archaic period, there are very, very few contemporary sources. What we do have are a few. We have the the Homeric epics and we have Hesiod. And then really, it's just fragments of lyric poets and so on. No, no kind of continuous accounts. When we do find fuller information, these are by authors who are writing centuries later. You know, people like Plutarch or Pausanias, you know, writing in 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 um, in AD uh, centuries. Um, so you know, that's that's something. Now, it doesn't mean they're necessarily making it up, but then you have to sort of ask yourself a whole series of questions about would they have reason. To make this up by considering the context in which they're writing rather than the context of the events that they're describing. And also something I, I one question I like to ask myself is um, how invested are these authors in you accepting what they say? Right? Because sometimes it's it's the throwaway information, right? The piece the, those are the sorts of items of information that they just assume people are going to sort of take uh as 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 given, right? It's when they get really hot under their collar and really try insisting on something that then you have to be perhaps a little more suspicious about what they're trying to tell you. I mean, hey, it's very valid because one of the things that I encountered as a student was always, for for whatever reason, and I don't know why, I wonder if it was just the, the classes I, I chose in the order I chose them, but I had to read either all of or parts of the Iliad, Odyssey, and Aeneid about six or seven different times, which is a lot. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I love these things, but there's only so many times you can read them and say the same things about them. So I was like, okay, okay. Um, but yeah, I think, because I, I remember it's, it stands out as a very clear memory, but somebody... Uh, in a class of mine when we were studying the the Aeneid, basically was positing that, oh, no, no, it makes sense, of course, like, this is super, it, it's it's right, it makes sense. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what the argument was. Uh, I, I have to ask this person. I'm still friends with them, luckily. But um, basically, they didn't take into account in their analysis the time that it was being written. And I remember somebody in class just spoke up and said, well, I mean... 
yeah, but there was there was a, a political agenda by Virgil. I was like, he wanted Augustus to like him. He wanted to set up this whole thing and be successful. And um, I remember everyone was kind of just like, oh, wait, right. Virgil was not right. He was writing. He had a political agenda and it was sort of completely forgotten. Um, and and then it led to some great discussions on, well, did Homer, or if if he was even one person, did he have a political agenda? When was Homer writing? And it brought up all these really great questions. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's methodology can be fun. Uh, I know a lot of people who didn't like it so much, but um, I think it 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 matters, right? You have to find it, discover it, and and how fun it can be in the right context. Because I think if you're just sort of presented with something and say, okay build me a methodology and go forth and have fun. Um, that might not really be as fun. <laughs> but it's, it, yeah, it's really interesting to hear. And it's really interesting to, to hear how it differs. I mean, I chose not to go in ancient history um, for, for my graduate degree. So I have limited experience using the ancient materials. I was working more with modern political stuff. So methodology is completely different there. Um, but it's, nice to hear how it can be fun and how it's 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 used in a different context and and i think it helps contextualize um the study of ancient history and and how archaeologists and other people go about their work um which is something i'm always very very curious to to learn more about since i didn't go into that but i kind of want to rewind a little bit because i really enjoy talking about the dorian invasion and all these theories about you know, what happened uh, during the Dark Age. But we tend to only hear about that in classes, I feel like, or maybe it's just it comes up as a random trivia fact or, or some someone random just brings it up. We are, as as humans, we love mysteries and we love conspiracy. Why, in your opinion, do we not have a lot of different media representations of the Dorian invasion or the Dorian period or whatever people want to call it. I mean, we have a billion films like 300 and all these other great films and TV shows and plays and books even that describe all these glorious battles, which obviously people like battles. I get it. People like natural disasters. Why do we not have anything on the Dorians? Like it's it it is a great mystery. I have no idea. I mean, that that I mean, it's a very valid question to which I have no answer, um, other than to say that there is a kind of tacit celebration of Dorianness in three hundred, um, simply because the Spartans were thought to be uber Dorians. Um, in other words, uh, all Dorians were thought of as being somewhat kind of austere and courageous and manly and stout. You know, I mean, this is this is why uh, Doric is the term given to a stout column as opposed to the sort of more effete ionic column, right? And it's just that the Spartans embodied these kinds of uh, stereotypical principles um, to the highest degree. So, so I, I think you know there is a certain amount of that lurking um beneath the background i think one possible answer is that at the time that i i came to write my dissertation and my first book which um talked about the dorians a lot the dorians had really fallen out of favor and again it's, it's partly due to this very tight connection with sparta um, but it's also due to a strain of um, German Romantic thinking um, that, that that started, I mean, started in the 19th century, um, but was taken to quite uh, extremes towards the end of the 19th century and obviously into the, the Third Reich, where um, Germans started identifying very heavily with Dorians, even, even to the extent that... Um, they posited that the original homeland of the Dorians wasn't actually northern Greece. It was much more north than that. It was in Germany. And, and you know, Hitler himself pointed to this peasant soup in Schleswig-Holstein, which apparently was made of sort of blood sausage, and, and said, you see, this is exactly what the Spartans used to eat, the famous black broth, 
that formed the diet of the Spartans. So, so you know, uh, this sort of interest in Midorians, um, an interest that was phrased in predominantly racial terms, to go back to, to our earlier conversation, um, I think discredited the whole study or e- even interest in Midorians for, for decades. Um, and it was only really when social anthropologists gave us new tools to think about ethnicity and the constructed nature of ethnic groups that that we could actually then start talking about Dorians again. Interesting. And I think that that ended up being very different than what I was expecting, which was it might just because, you know, it's so hard. We don't have one firm strand of evidence. We we can't put it together in a nice pretty bow the way we can narratively just tell the story of the Persian War or something. That hasn't stopped filmmakers in the past, has it? No, you're right. If anything, having uh, fewer you know, points of, of, of historical accuracy and evidence would actually just make for a better fantasy story, maybe. But, and it's it's interesting how a part of, of Greek history gets wrapped up in, in, in Nazi ideology and propaganda and all that Spartan stuff. Um, I, I feel like someone told me once that Hitler himself was a classicist, um well interested in classical things um yeah it's very interesting um i guess i hadn't realized how much the 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 dorian culture had seeped into sparta yeah okay well i was was i was th- trying to think of like three questions at once and then of course i lost all of them oops well i i was actually uh, reading an article uh, recently by i think it was eleftheria yanadu Drawing attention to the fact that in the early 40s, I forget which year exactly, uh, Nazi troops recreated the Battle of Thermopylae. Right? I mean, they actually went to Thermopylae, um, which incidentally had been excavated just a few years later by by a Greek dictator uh, named Yanis Metaxas. Um, but the Nazi troops, when they were occupying Greece, uh, they sort of restaged the Battle of Thermopylae. And there are there are pictures there are pictures that exist um, of this, and uh, I'm not quite sure who they recruited to play the Persians, but the Persians were all dressed up in of all things African costumes, right? I mean, so it, it was it was very very heavily racialized, and and and, and the Spartans, you know, the Spartans are a, a fast. I'm actually teaching a course this winter on the. Spartans. I mean, they're, they're a fascinating subject, particularly for the methodological point of view, because so much that is thought about Sparta is totally fake, bogus, invented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but they're also deeply problematic for the ways that they've been used uh, or abused, I should say, uh, by subsequent historical generations. Which is tragic. It's it's so tragic. Um, I, I it's something I talk about frequently, which is I hate how people feel free to use and abuse ancient history to have it suit their own agenda i suppose um but then again i guess that then goes to the larger question of you know will we ever be capable of non-politicizing history and not using it to serve a greater agenda um and i guess uh, i'm i'm pretty cynical about it because i think no but i mean do you believe that there would be a way to have some type of more universal objective history that's not just so twisted no uh well okay there are there are, there are really two questions there um i don't think that some sort of universal objective history can exist and i'm not sure that i actually want it to exist because it seems to me if, if history is going to remain relevant it it has to be because it is a dialogue between present and past all right we are inevitably going to interpret the past in ways that make sense in the present. The only thing we have to do, though, and if we didn't, it wouldn't mean anything to us, right? If we interpreted the past in its own terms, which are probably incommensurable with our, our norms and ideals and so on, it, it wouldn't make much sense. So so we do this. This is why a history of the Greek world written by you know Jeremy McInerney um in this decade is going to look very very different from one that's written by George Grote um or or let alone a German historian like Berve or, or, or so on so um and that's okay i think as long as we're upfront about it as long as we're open and transparent 
about how we are interpreting the past. When it becomes insidious is when you're using it, as you say, for your own purposes, but try to conceal that, try to um, dissimulate the this is somehow gospel truth that you're relaying to people. All right. Whereas, I mean, we just have to say that all historical interpretations are essentially contingent. <laughs> and they'll be replaced by different historical interpretations that will mean different things for future generations. Well, that's something new to think about that I hadn't thought about. Um, but yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. Um, yet, so it definitely it just seems that it's more contingent than ever on humans to just uh, reform ourselves. And that, and that, and, and that's why history is a humanistic discipline. Well, it definitely makes sense there. Absolutely makes sense there. Um, but basically, I, I could go on and, and, and ask so many more questions, but obviously we would be here for the next 10 years. So I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll control my, myself. But um, there are three questions I generally just want to ask to sort of end the interview portion uh, of the podcast, which is um, when you were a student, either an undergrad or in grad school, did you attend office hours? <laughs> no, that, that, you know, there really wasn't. Um, if, if by office hours you mean a designated time that's the same time every week, no, there wasn't. Um, Oxford and Cambridge, for that matter, proceed uh, most of instruct. Well, lectures are entirely voluntary, um, and many people don't or didn't, as I should say, go to lectures if they were particularly early in the morning, for instance. Um, but the main mode of instruction is via tutorials, which are one-on-one -on -one or, or two-on-one. So that's sort of the equivalent of an office hour, right? Because you will have prepared an essay that you read out and you'll talk about it, but you can talk about other issues as well. And then when it comes to graduate uh, level, then um, you, you know, usually when you finish a chapter, you make a appointment with your supervisor and that sort of serves as an office hour. But but no, in terms of, of regular, th there may be now, but it's certainly not when I was at university. Okay. Well, um, y and I suppose for the second question, you can answer it now in, in your capacity as, as a professor in, in the American system, which does have office hours. Um, do you have like a specific conversation or memory or something fun that stands out from an office hour conversation? Um well, I would say, I mean, I actually find myself sitting on my own for most of office hours. Um, and students generally only tend to come if, if a paper is due. So if I'm thinking about moments where I actually could genuinely say, you know, that was just such a fascinating time. Uh, there was occasion actually a few weeks back. Uh, where a couple of students just showed up and they didn't really, I mean, they were sort of talking about the paper, but the paper was still distant enough that they didn't have any specific questions about it. But it really just became a sort of free form meditation about the ancient world among two students, one of whom was a classics major, the other wasn't. She was actually a, a scientist, I think. But just, you know, really intelligent, fun conversation that, that went well beyond, I think, the, the hour that was designated. Nice. Okay, that's fun when you have you know, random fun conversations pop up. Well, and then the, the, the last question is, um, as, as an educator, um, yeah, if you had to give like a elevator pitch to students for why they should come to office hours, you know, what would you say to them? Oh, well, I, I would like to persuade them um, that I have all sorts of techniques to communicate my enthusiasm for the ancient world. And they're far more interesting than just sort of saying, what does an essay look like? I mean, you know, I understand that that's important as well. I, you know, if they, they need help with their, their papers and so on. But but really, the, you know, there's so much to discuss about the ancient world that I can't possibly fit into three hours of classes in a week. And office hours would be the obvious place to sort of spill over um and uh disseminate some of that additional uh material and thoughts yeah you get great conversation kind of off the cuff you get to know professor and if you were my professor she had the famous departmental chocolate drawer so 
you I basically part of the reason I was always running up there is I wanted a handful of chocolate and uh, as long as she was there and the office was open, uh, we could get that. And the nice part is she left it open for non student well, classic students um, and people who are in the department. If you just happen to be a student from anywhere and you wanted chocolate, she would offer you some chocolate. And yeah. Well, our administrative assistant takes on that role in our department. But. I mean, I feel like we're always trying to figure out creative ways to lure students to, to come talk to us, right? <laughs> Um, but anyway, so at the end of each podcast, I ask if every guest will read Shelley's beautiful Ozymandias poem. And after you've read the poem, I'm interested to know, you know, what you think about this poem, because this is consistently usually cited as a very influential poem. And I've heard thing, people say things like, it stood the test of time because it's so relevant today. Or I've heard people say, I don't really know. It seems pretty ancient and I don't like poetry. So... Uh, there's so many different ways to interpret poetry. Yeah, I'm just curious to know what you think of it and, you know, has it stood the test of time and why do you think people always come back to it as something of okay. great importance? All right. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them, and the hearts that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, rounds the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless, and bear the lone and level sands stretch far away. At first glance, one gets the impression that this is a, a meditation on, I guess, you know, transient ephemerality, the, the transient ephemerality of, of, of human de deeds. Um, there's you know the whole uh, talking about these uh, the the fragments of the statue as, as as lifeless and this this sort of aura of decay um, and uh, devastation and desolation. I mean, a lot of it is, is is not unlike some of the early poetry of 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 Shelley's uh, on again off again friend Byron, right? Although here it's it, it it's situated in Egypt rather than than the Greek landscape and. When you mentioned whether, you know, whether the poem itself uh, sort of still remains relevant, I mean, I suppose the the sort of distinction that one's drawing is that is that ancient trope between, we could, we could call it materialism and idealism, or between words and things, right? Um, I mean, one thinks of Horace's description of his odes, right, as a monumentum aere perennius, a monument more lasting um, than bronze. Um, but I think actually the poem rather pushes back um, against those sorts of interpretations. First, because in a certain sense, this isn't really Shelley's monumentum, right? It, it's focalized not through the poetic eye, but through this uh, anonymous traveler, right? He's the one who's talking about it. Um, and secondly, at the end of the day, this statue of Ozymandias may not be intact, but it has at least partially survived the ravages of time, right? And not only that, but its materiality is what generates the observations of the foreign traveller, which is what generates the sonnet. So, you know, this, this, this sort of... Um, it, the poem itself isn't necessarily what is the monumentum ire perennius. I, I think, you know, I think what I take away from this is not so much a sense of temporality as a meditation on agency, right? It's that you or I, any historical individual, ultimately doesn't get to write the narrative, doesn't get to control the narrative. Um, it's all right, you know, Ozymandias has his own ideas about his place in the world and the wonderful monuments that he's constructed, but it's almost immediately subverted by the hand of the sculptor. 
And then it's subverted further by the passage of time and the fact that most of the rest of these monuments have been swallowed up by the encroaching sand. Well, that is definitely spot on. Um, I completely agree. And I definitely do look at this poem as a very political statement. Um, Yeah, as you said, ephemerality, political power and, and other things. And it brings up these serious questions about monumentality, what sticks, what doesn't. And, you know, I... I think it just basically is one nice, neat 14-line memento mori, basically reminding people that, well, you're all doomed to die. So, pip pip, you know, Um, work together, do as best you can. But uh, in the end, yeah, you, you don't have any control over how things will shake out. And having, like, having this this great idea of what this poem stands for, then, um. The last question I like to ask every guest is if we consider our contemporary society right now, do we have a type of modern Ozymandias in the world, something that we think is so great and amazing and it'll last forever because it's monumental? Or will we look back at something and say, well, what were we thinking? This was completely stupid and ridiculous, and I don't know why we thought this was a great idea. So I don't think it takes a huge stretch of the imagination to call to mind powerful, hubristic narcissists who are obsessed with their own standing in the world and their own place in history, their legacy, if you like. Um, but whom I'm pretty sure will be remembered by history in rather different ways to how they hope they're going to be imagined. I think I don't need to say any more, do I? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, that could be three or four different people. Actually, it could be a lot more than that. So a, a lot more. We than, can yeah. just categorize it to that ar- archetype of a person and do. 10,000 people will pop up. Yes, basically. Um, Yeah, great answer. Great answer. Um, And then I kind of lied to you because the actual last questions I wanted to ask are, where can people find you if they would like to follow your work or, uh, I don't know, contact you to see if they could, you know, study something related to to what you've worked on in your career okay well i you know i'm not a creature of social media but uh i am contactable by email and uh, that can be found on uh my web page and either the department of history or the department of classics at the university of chicago great well we will make sure to put all the relevant links in and um if i remember correctly you had a book that's relatively recent last year was it yeah yeah Okay. Um, and we can link that as well so people can find your book as well. That would be great. That, uh, that That's a, really a book about more about modern Greece than ancient Greece, but, but it's, it was a lot of fun. Great, great. Well, thank you so much again for joining me. It's been really, really fun getting to talk a little more in depth about methodology and, and other wonderful topics that I don't really get to talk about very often at all. So, um, yeah, well, I, I hope to, to have you back on in some capacity uh, in the future. Look forward to it. Thanks, Lexi. Trireme Transit is now departing ancient office hours. Next stop is Present Ponderings. <laughs> 